when we're socially isolated, uh, that's a really critical thing because if you're locked in a flat uh, with no human contact, you've got to work hard to maintain your spirits, uh, essentially, because it matters for your immune system. Hey guys, it's Matt Haycox here, and today I'm filming another part of our Corona podcast series where I talk to various experts from all different fields, but who are specifically related in some way, shape, or form to what is going on in the Corona world right now. Uh, you know, we, we, we've looked at medicine, we've looked at finance, we've looked at uh, what else? We, we've looked at um, uh, pandemic, you know, pa panic type things, and and Alan is going to be a, a bit of all of that for us, really. I mean, Alan. A physician, he's an immunologist. You know, I'm getting better and better at saying that word. He's an mm. immunologist. <laughs> I spoke too soon. He's an immunologist, he's a neuroscientist, a TEDx speaker, and a businessman. Uh, and I guess, you know, for me, that's what's going to make him uniquely placed today to, to, to talk about both the medical side and the economic and the business consequences. Because once a doctor, uh, well, once a doctor, always a doctor, but once a doctor, now a businessman, um, you know, th there's, there's going to be some really interesting take on this. So, guys who are watching this after the fact, we're streaming this live onto Facebook. Facebook, we're streaming this live onto YouTube. So if we get some questions along the way from the audience, we will try and um, involve those as and where we can. So Alan, thanks for being here, buddy. Oh, really nice to be here, Matt, and uh, nice to be speaking to a lad from Yorkshire. <laughs> well, My wife's from Yorkshire, as I told you before we started, so I feel somewhat at home already. Don't worry, we're very friendly. We're we're very friendly, e even over even over the virtual screen. Listen, Alan, I guess I want to give a little bit of background to you, uh, and then I really want to kind of you know jump jump in on the on the Corona side. But I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. conscious, and again, just to put this into context, I'm conscious that we're filming this on the 10th of April. So, mm -hmm. so we're now probably well, we're two and a half weeks into lockdown. Yeah, I think yeah, we're two and mm -hmm. a half weeks into lockdown. We're a good five or six weeks at least you know depending on how you want to view this uh, in, in into corona having an impact on businesses and 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 we're months and months into all the bullshit that's on facebook and whatsapp mm. <laughs> and and i guess that, that, that's the kind of context i want to frame this around that there's i don't want to go too early back to you know what what is a coronavirus and stuff you know we, we, we all we all know those bits i guess but i'd, I'd like to bring the medical side into into the kind of current situation that we're at now. I want to talk about balance. I want to get your views on on, on lockdown um, and you know, not not hypothesizing about when we're all going to be released because, because mm. it, it is what it is. But uh, but just ju just just really start to start to you know give the guys at home some some meaningful knowledge. Not to you know not the usual Karen from Facebook fodder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Well, I'd be delighted to do so. There's lots of really interesting stories that just aren't being covered by the. I mean, I've stopped watching the BBC because it's the same inane stuff every single day and there's uh, and there's a lot of great stories out there that just aren't being told so hopefully we can get to some of those well, go on. I'll, I'll let you be the storyteller mate, mate you t tell us some good ones right now well uh, I mean I'm very fascinated that people um, are sort of banging on about the whole vaccination thing and uh, as a sort of PhD immunology uh, that's something that's pretty interesting to me uh, and we sort of seem to be drifting to this position that um, viruses by definition are a bad thing uh, and they're really not I mean they're the basic DNA building blocks of the whole of the biosphere so every living thing on the planet is dependent on viruses um, so at every level of the ocean for example there are billions and billions of viruses and if you didn't have those viruses dealing with the bacteria all the oceans would be a sort of fetid pongy mess so we actually need the viruses. They're in sort of in relationship to the bacteria and the bacteria in relationship to us, which I'll come to. So this whole notion that we've got to get rid of all viruses, they're a bad thing, eradicate or va vaccinate the shit out of them, you know, get that's just not sensible. I mean, human beings wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for viruses. So we've got to take a slightly more kind of subtle and nuanced view about what's really going on. And you have people opining uh, about virology uh, who just see a very narrow picture, you know, in relation to vaccination or whatever. But there's actually a much more interesting story around viruses and their role in human evolution even uh, that hasn't yet come out. So we can dig into that if you're interested. No, please, please. And also, uh, what, what a question's popped up in my comment box while we we're talking as well. And Rebecca De Giorgio has said, if we have a low immune system, what are the best immune boosters for the virus? Uh, that's a great question. And... Um, 
what you'll see if you go on a, some of the government health sites or uh, trotting out about the mental health issues, which I, we can also talk about, um, is you'll get the usual suspects, uh, you know, nutrition and take a break and all that kind of stuff. But the thing, again, that isn't being talked about, the biggest determinant of uh, immune function is the level of cortisol in your body, which is the body's main stress hormone. Uh, and the biggest determinant of your cortisol level is whether you're in a positive or negative emotion. So when you go into a negative emotional state, that pushes up your cortisol um, and makes you more susceptible to the virus. It makes it more likely if you get the virus, it'll be a more profound problem and it makes you more contagious. Now, also, interestingly, the opposite is true. So you can boost your immune system by you know, cultivating more positive emotional states. So the skinny on it is the more you panic and worry, uh, whether it's about your job, your future, the future of the world or whatever, the more you panic and worry, the more you lower your immune system. Uh, and if you maintain optimism and positivity, even in the face of these difficulties, that's boosting your immune system. So it's really, really important to uh, learn to maintain a positive emotional state, even in the midst of this crisis. A, a few, a few people are jumping in, uh, jumping in the comments now. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be pleased to know you're already my most traffic, uh, traffic viewer of the last few days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, Paul Miller is saying, is it the case that if you get the virus, you will then become immune, or is, is that just an assumption? Uh, mostly, it's it's the case. So you'll develop antibodies, but not everybody develops antibodies. So again, the immune system is so incredibly beautiful and nuanced. Uh, but as a general rule of thumb, if you get the virus, you will develop the antibodies, and you'll be non-contagious. But it's not a hundred percent. But you know, ninety-nine point whatever. Uh, so basically, yes. So, so um, Ayaz has said, Ayaz is a friend of mine. Hey, Ayaz, nice to see you. He has said that he is on immunosuppressants, but he's come off them temporarily. Is that because he wants to effectively catch the virus to, 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 to develop an immunity to it? Well, uh, it's him that's come off it, so I guess you better ask him that question. Oh, oh, no, I'm, I'm actually using <laughs> a medical question. But <laughs> he's, he's just made the statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, again, it, it's it's a little bit complicated. So um, depending on what other conditions he's on, if he's suppressing his immune system with uh, some sort of steroid, uh, coming off that steroid uh, might boost his immune system temporarily. So if he happens to catch the virus, uh, he might have a less virulent or um, uh, florid. Sorry, I, I, he's, I think uh, I've misunderstood his question. He's, he's popping ah. up in the box now. <laughs> he's, he's saying, should they come off? Uh, well, not with that medical advice is what I say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, is, this is often a question asked of ex-doctors is, doctor, can I stop my tablet? I, I mean, I'm basically a big believer in skills, not pills. So I'm a general believer is, if at all possible, come off everything. Uh, but of course, if you're on immunosuppressants, there's of, often a serious reason for that. So you certainly shouldn't do that without at least some consultation with a medical professional. Just to be clear to anyone who does comment on this, Alan is not covered by my PI. So this, <laughs> this is purely for entertainment purposes and educational purposes. Not, exactly. Nothing Alan, Alan or I say we can be held responsible for. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, but yeah, you, I mean, going, going back, going back to the situation w w where we're in, w w where what 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 are we looking at going forward in, in you know in, in terms of the, the lockdown situation and from a medical perspective? I mean, is is it go? Do you, do you see it being laxed partially as as you know the more people have got the virus and more people have developed immunity to it? I mean, you know, what is the, the you know the layman's skinny? Well, yes, is a simple answer to that. That's probably what will happen. Um, but it's actually, again, a lot more complicated and we're getting told of overly simplistic stories. So, for example, uh, you know, Boris was talking about flattening the top of the sombrero, right, and actually elongating, uh, you know, the sort of infection, you know, rather than it being a really intense, potentially overwhelming the health service couple of weeks, let's flatten it out to four or five weeks. But of course, what's not being talked about in that scenario is the further you extend the viral infection, the more likely that it will mutate. You know, so it, th these are balancing acts. You know, you're, you're trading one thing off against another. You know, and, and the whole strategy as far as in mean, most countries, not just ours, uh, seems to be uh, we've got to, the burden of suffering is all about the death rate. Um, and we can talk about 
why is the death rate so variable across Europe? But the whole strategy is based, we've got to reduce the number of deaths and we've got to reduce the overwhelm of the healthcare system. But again, another thing that's not being talked about is the burden of suffering isn't just about people who die. I mean, obviously, we want to try and prevent as many deaths as possible, but there's a huge sort of mental health burden of suffering that will happen and an economic suffering, uh, particularly for those that uh, are impoverished. There's some very interesting data, for example, uh, in terms of the racial disparity of cases in North America. Um, and it's largely, uh, you know, poverty related. So people who are poorer can't socially distance. Uh, they're often in, you know, these sort of heroic frontline workers or drivers. They're often more exposed. Um, and so, you know, there are quite a few sort of uh, other things that we really need to be considering other than everybody stay at home, not everybody can. If you go into Africa and you go into other poor countries like Mexico, social distancing is impossible in many of those countries. So it's going to be very easy, uh, interesting, I should say, to compare the uh, infection rates and the death rates in countries that can't socially isolate as easily as Great Britain. Uh, and these things should be being discussed right now. You know, the herd immunity that Scandinavia is sort of leaning a bit more towards herd immunity than we are. We haven't really had a proper debate in the UK about herd immunity or not herd immunity. So should we have locked certain populations away dr draconian uh, style and then let sort of young people catch the virus? And we've never really had a pop. We've got a one size fits all over simplistic strategy, as far as I can tell. And I mean, should this be something that's dealt with on a on a kind of country by country basis, or 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 should there be more, uh, you know, I guess general world rules that apply? You know, I mean, I was talking to someone the other, the other day about I think you know, G Germany and uh, I forget which other country where where they're well, they don't have lock, they haven't had lockdown, have they? I mean, pe people there are pretty much behaving as normal. I mean, why why do we have the two extremes? And and, and I mean, is it as simple as the fact that not of not as many people have have caught caught it there? And they're able to behave differently, or are they just taking a completely different, you know, different uh, approach to the to the solution? Well, some nations are taking a completely different approach. So, for example, uh, Germany has a much much lower death rate than, say, Italy, uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, not least that there's no global consensus in how to diagnose a death from COVID. So, you know, uh, the general rule of thumb is in Italy. If you enter hospital with anything uh, and you happen to be COVID positive and die, it's called a COVID death. Even though the death might have been from a heart attack or a co cancer complication or whatever, it's still called a COVID death. They're not doing that in Germany. You're only called a COVID death in Germany if you actually died from a COVID complication. So people who go in uh, with cancer uh, and happen to have COVID but died of the cancer thing, that's not called a COVID death. So there's no global consensus on how to report the statistics, which is making it very difficult. Uh, there's no global consensus on how to test, when to test, who to test. So hopefully one of the things that will come out of this is we have to get our act together globally. I mean, uh, you know, this, this proves very clearly that all nations on the planet need to talk to each other and share their stats, and the stats need to be accurate. There's been a lot of noise, as, as I'm sure you're aware about. Well, how true are the Chinese stats, really? Yeah. Um, but we've got to get our act together because, of course, it's affected everybody. And part of the difficulty in dealing with it on a global basis is we're all counting differently. Um, so that we do need some consistency across the globe, but we don't need a one size fits all. As I said, you know, Mexico, there's 50 percent of uh, the population of Mexico are on the poverty line and they can't socially isolate and they have to keep going out, you know, to keep their lives to basically to eat and drink. Um, and so it's pointless having the strategy we have for the UK for Mexico. It would be wholly inappropriate. And again, big swathes of Africa. And in Mexico, again, just using them as an example, the, the number of people over 70 is about 7% of the population. So the at risk is a completely different set of people. Uh, I mean, Mexico has very high levels uh, of, of blood pressure um, and obesity, for example, much higher than we might see over here but they don't have a, an elderly population. So the at-risk population is very different. So you do need some variation country by country, and you do need some consistency. So both and is the answer to that question.
And you, you touched on earlier upon um, mental health concerns and, and, and economic concerns. I mean, I was going to say, you know, when, when do you think we will see those in coming into play from a strategic perspective? I mean, I guess the answer is it, it's going on behind the scenes at the moment. But us, us as lay public, you know, all, all we're really seeing or hearing about is, is the, uh, the actual, you know, COVID me medical concerns. You know, at what point do you, do you think we're going to start to hear government directive and, and change of plans from mental health and from from an economic perspective well it's already happening but it's not you know breaking through the you know constant diet of death rates uh but it's already happening now it's as you say it's going on a bit behind the scenes um and, and one of the things about mental health in fact i did a blog on this uh is called it's not mental and it's not health part of our difficulty you know and this is worldwide uh, is that we misdiagnose uh, mental health as mental health because um, most cases of mental health problems, whether it's, you know, let's take two examples, anxiety and depression, there is nothing wrong with thinking. There's nothing wrong with cognition or your mental processes. So, but we keep calling it mental health, like, oh, you're mental. You've got a mental health. Well, it's not mental, it's emotional. The problem is emotional. It's not with your thinking. So thinking is normal in most cases of anxiety and depression and stress and panic and overwhelm. Your thinking processes are normal. Mental health is something like schizophrenia, where the mental processes don't work properly. So we should stop calling it mental health because it's misdiagnosing the problem. And also, it's not really a health problem. It's a development problem. We haven't developed the ability to regulate our emotions properly. So if you haven't done that, you get overwhelmed with panic and so on. Um, so that it really should be called emotional well-being, not mental health. And the more we continue to mislabel it as mental health, makes it harder and harder to treat it effectively because we're, we're pursuing the wrong target, uh, if that makes sense. No, for sure. So we're going to go on in a second to talk talk about business, you know, your business, and particularly how how you started to uh, to adapt under these circumstances. But a few more questions have just popped up in the chat box, so I want to kind of make the most of this and uh, and uh, get some audience feedback. Um, so so Rebecca's popped up again, and she's saying, if we do catch the virus and our body fights it, what is the time scale that it goes out of your system? Uh, well, depending on which strain you have, and again, one of the variants uh, across Europe is there are two, there are eight strains effectively, but there are two major strains. Um, and Iceland, uh, and one of the guys that works for me is uh, the detective that's hunting down the contact tracing in Iceland. Um, and they're really pursuing the two main strains. But how long it lasts depends on your level of immunity. But the rough rule of thumb is if you're sort of effectively symptom free for 10 days you're fine and non-contagious that's the rough rule of thumb but it is quite variable person to person as we've seen with sort of boris uh versus matt hancock you know one's back at work mysteriously in six days um and uh you know boris is still only just out of intensive care so it does vary quite a bit person by person and we've got we've got one one general medical question here, which we'll we'll, we'll keep as our last because I want to try and keep on the on the corona theme. But Neil, is it about his knees? So again, it's just not it about enough? his knees, and he's not got a rash. <laughs> he's not he's not cold <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> Neil is a fan of cold water exposure, and he'd like oh. to know what, what your views on cold water exposure are, how it benefits the immune system, and I guess simultaneously with that, the immunity benefits of heat therapy such as saunas and steam rooms. Uh, yes, so two things to say about that. I mean, Wim Hof is the great advocate of cold water exposure, uh, you know, and uh, sort of swimming in cold water and so on. Uh, and again, the rough rule of thumb with any of these things, like how helpful is dot, 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 fill in the blank, exercise, 10 pints of beer, um, you know, wh whatever you want, whatever your particular favorite practice is. Uh, and the rough rule of thumb of, uh, of how helpful any of these things are is the emotional consequences of those things. So let's take a really simple example, not, not cold water exposure, but uh, going to the gym. Now, you know, it's sort of widely perceived that going to the gym is by definition a good thing. But if you go to the gym and you don't really enjoy going to the gym, you know, uh, but your other half has been banging on to you because you're putting on a few pounds and you need to get down that gym and you sort of feel somewhat harangued to going to the gym, all that happens is you go to the gym, you don't really enjoy it, you actually put your cortisol level up, 
and it undermines the benefit of the exercise itself. Um, so the best exercise is the exercise you love because if you're in that positive emotional state, you put up the anabolic hormones like DHEA uh, and you get that immune boost. So uh, whether it's you know cold water exposure, going to the gym, cycling, running, swimming, uh, or frankly, sit at home you know, reading a book, uh, the most beneficial health practices uh, you can engage in are the ones you really enjoy that enable you to access a positive emotion and sustain a positive emotion. So I'm le much less prescriptive about what type of practice, uh, but pay attention to the, con the emotional consequence of that practice, whether it's 10 pints of beer or going to the gym. It's, it's interesting you say that, actually, because I, I was actually on somebody else's podcast just an hour or so b b before before we've come on this together. Uh, and uh, I, so I, I was answer answering a few questions for the audience and somebody asked, what is um, what, what is the best platform to be learning on and what podcasts should they be following and what books should they be reading? And I, and I effectively gave a very similar answer to, you know, to what you've given there insofar as it's not my place to tell you what you know, what you should be reading, or what the best method of, of, of education for you is, you know, I think, you know, we can all accept as a given that you should be learning. You should, you know, you, you should be learning more. You, you know, you should be reading, whether that's in in a written format or or, or, or an audio format, and you should be you know, looking up to some mentors or or, 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 or some influencers. But um, only you know who resonates with you best. Only you know who you can learn from best, and only you know what are what are the topics that, you know that are relevant relevant to your space your life and 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 your business I, I guess you know as soon as you started to say that it, it just uh, it just kind of you know took me back to that answer that i think well, yeah, w w whatever you do you've got to make sure it's the right thing for you and that you enjoy it because otherwise you know you just won't stick to it although yeah, I guess, and, and, and I'd, add, I'd add to that you know read widely uh, and read various sources and also read things that you would naturally disagree with because there's a real risk of you, you know, just reinforcing your own prejudice and getting into a bit of a, uh, a bubble, an echo chamber of your own making. But are we giving permission to, for fatties to stay on the couch eating hula hoops during Corona or, 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 or should they go out there and do some exercise? <laughs> well, well, we all need to go out and do some exercise, <laughs> but then do the exercise that you enjoy. Uh, I mean, human beings weren't designed to be fat. I mean, you know, if you look at hunter-gatherer tribes, you don't see... Uh, a load of corp corp corpulent uh, individuals uh, striding across the savannah. We're not really designed for it. I mean, we've only become fat because we've got uh, an excessive availability of food at a cheap price, uh, and we've kind of got a bit slovenly. So, um, you know, we're, we're not really designed for that. that our, our system doesn't work optimally if we carry too much weight. So it's a general rule of thumb. Um, but what I would say in what we call the three biggies, uh, and it's a bit of a, a literary joke, you know, three big E's, which is uh, exercise, um, uh, eating and emotions. Uh, you might exercise two or three times a week if you're lucky. You eat two or three times, maybe four times a day. But the emotions are every single second of every single day. So in wondering, you know, which of these three E's is having the biggest effect on your immunity and your health. Uh, our view is, it, well, it's emotions. It's every single second of every single day. It's not two or three times a day or two or three times a week. So learning to regulate, and that's the piece that's always missed. So when you see people that are offering advice, they go to the exercise and they go to the nutrition, but they never go to the emotions. And the emotions is the elephant in the room that most people always ignore. It's, it's interesting as well you say about uh, that, um, that um, people being fat has come into play because there's a, an easy availability of food at a cheap price. And I, I, always, I always remember an article I read uh, quite a long time ago now in GQ magazine, which was a, it was effectively a, uh, a review on uh, a water fast. You know, so, mm -hmm. so um, the, the 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 author had gone and done whatever it was—a one week, two week, three week water fast—and uh, he'd actually. I mean, I guess you could just do it at home, drinking water, but he'd done mm -hmm. it, you know, under medical supervision in in, in some kind of spa. Uh, and and the whole background to this was that all the all the ailments that we suffer nowadays never used to exist many, many, many years ago, or if they did exist, they they, they were basically called you know like the the ailments of rich people because. Because if you were poor, you didn't have enough money to eat the food and stuff yourself with all the shit that actually that actually caused caused these issues. And you know, like what one guy that springs to mind was Henry VIII, who suffered from everything because obviously he had he had enough money to uh, enough money to gouge. Um, so.
Yeah, well, uh, we suffered, you know, the diseases of modern man. And, and the other thing I'd add into that, it's, again, we tend to overindulge uh, because we suddenly got all this stuff available. So go back to the sort of 1850s and people were pretty impoverished, uh, you know, in village life. A lot of people starved. So it wasn't until factories started to get going and we got mass production uh, that an economy was even born. And as the economy gradually evolved, people got you know better off and so on gradually over the years and the decades. Um, so a lot of the diseases of modern man are partly down to you know our excessive indulgence and the ready availability of food. But also the biggest predictor of most of these modern diseases is the ratio between the stress hormone cortisol and DHEA, its antidote. And if you run around with a very high level of cortisol and a low DHEA, that will increase your risk of obesity, diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure, and senile dementia. So your cortisol DHEA ratio is unbelievably critical. You've got to drop the cortisol level and up the DHEA. And one of the best ways to do that, which will also enhance your immunity, is try and live your life over the sort of pos what we call the positive side of the universe, not the negative side. Um, and most people live relatively stressful lives, and there's a double whammy here because they haven't been taught how to regulate their emotion. So most people's experience is something happens and they feel shit, and they don't know how to get out of it, or they feel panicked or anxious or worried. And if you say to them, okay, uh, I recognize that you feel a bit worried about the future or whatever's going on, I want you to move from that state of worry to a state of patience or to a state of appreciation. Most people can't do that, Matt. Why not? We weren't taught it at school and we haven't been taught it since. But that's unbelievably important for your, for your immune system and your general performance in life, whatever it is, whether you're a business person or a sports person. Living your life in a more positive emotional state is really critical for your health, well-being and performance. I'm going to throw one more audience question in before we go on. I promise I will make it the last. It's just, you're giving mm -hmm. some, some fantastic answers here. And I, I, you know, what I like about uh, what you're talking is you, you're really you know, distilling it into simple information that, you know, that, that we can all understand here. But Paul Gourlay's jumped in. He's, he said, what about cholesterol? I try to be mainly plant-based, but I've heard that, that good cholesterol, uh, in brackets, I forget, is it LDL? Is HDL. HDL is helpful in protecting the cell linings and helps slow down virus replication in the body. I mean, I guess plant plant based veganism is all all the range nowadays. Uh, what, what, what's your thoughts? Uh, read Malcolm Kendrick, the great cholesterol con. Uh, so that will completely reset the way he views the whole cholesterol problem, uh, because it's a, it's a very different story uh, about cholesterol. And why do we believe that cholesterol is so important than what most people believe? In fact, it's, there's a fascinating uh, review of why do we believe uh, these risk factors for heart disease? Uh, uh, there's a wonderful book by uh, James Lefanu uh, called A Cry Unheard, The Medical Consequences of Loneliness, uh, which might be relevant to the whole COVID crisis here, that uh, one of the reasons we believe the risk factors up for heart disease are the risk factors for heart disease is it was all set up around um, uh, in the sort of 1948, 1952, a study was set up in a small leafy town just outside Boston called Framingham. And it's been, these studies have been going ever since. And that's dictated what doctors think are the risk factors for heart disease based on all this research that came out of this small leafy town. But what they didn't realize when they set this study up is Framingham is non-representative. So back in the sort of late 40s, early 50s, uh, the divorce rate in Framingham was 2%. Uh, and then it, in America, it was 10% at that time. Of course, it's now about 40 or 50%. But back in the day, it was sort of 2%. So people who sort of born in Framingham, lived in Framingham, worked in Framingham, died in Framingham. And it was a wonderful place. But it bear, bore no resemblance to inner city Detroit, for example, where there was poverty and social inequity and all sorts of other things. And so what we started to believe were the risk factors for heart disease and many other things were based on a really abnormal population. Um, and uh, cholesterol latterly came into that whole thing. Um, and so what we never took into account was some of the factors that didn't exist in Framingham. So the divorce rate was very low. The poverty rate was very low. Uh, education, everybody was educated. So, so those factors didn't exist. And, they, and also they didn't think to look for them. Um, and if you go and read James Lefano, A Cry Unheard, go back. He reanalyzes the entire data set, knowing what we know now. And it 
paints a very different picture. So, for example, if you're unfortunate enough to go into a, a hospital uh, with a heart attack, what predicts whether you're alive or dead uh, one year from that, that having having had that heart attack? And if you ask even doctors, you know, what's the biggest risk factor? What what advice do you need to give the patients? Most people would say stop smoking. Uh, if you're smoking, stop smoking. But actually. If you go in with depression, you're four times more likely to be dead a year later than if you got you haven't got depression. And that's twice the effect of smoking. And again, that's just not talked about. Again, it's emotion because it's every single second of every single day. So this is the big factor that people perpetually miss. And it's unbelievably critical for heart disease, for immunity, for COVID, and so on. So when we're socially isolated, uh, that's a really critical thing because if you're locked in a flat uh, with no human contact, you've got to work hard to maintain your spirits, uh, essentially, because it matters for your immune system. And not just from whether you get infected with COVID or not, but other diseases that might start to kick in. Cool. Oh, well, let's, let's take it away from medical and move over okay. to business because you don't just look at rashes and squeeze spots. You are also the CEO and co-founder <laughs> of Complete. Um, just, uh, just give us a little, a little bit of background to what your business is, but then what I want to specifically talk about is, is how, how you've adapted, adapted your business mm -hmm. model. You've effectively transformed that business model overnight, moved on to an entirely uh, online platform. So I, I guess I'd like to know what, you know, what, what strategies you've used, uh, you know, what, what tips and techniques can be replicated by my audience, and also where you think that business is now going to be once, once lockdown and, and corona are, are out of the mm -hmm. way. OK, um, well, the, the link between I mean, I was a jobbing physician for about 12 years as a consultant on the ward. And I did some time in general practice, too. Um, and for me, uh, it was always about reducing human suffering, but at scale. Uh, now, as I, I mentioned to you before we came on air, um, if you're a GP uh, or if you're a consultant in the hospital, you have 50 patients on the ward, 150 outpatients. So you've got a 200 lives to deal with. Um, and that was always never quite enough. Uh, people for me I thought well I'll go into general practice you've got 2,000 but 1,800 of them well you never see them so again you've only got 200 lives to play with so I was always more interested in trying to achieve a more of a scale reduction uh, of human suffering so I thought well if I go and work with corporations um, you know some of our clients have got 350,000 employees for example if you change the quality of leadership and the quality of decision making in those big multinational corporations it can improve the lives of 350,000 employees. And if you take their family, that's a million. If you take the supply base, that's 5 million. Uh, so my company works with about 100 multinationals, um, and we're trying to reduce human suffering across the world, essentially by improving the quality of leadership and decision-making in those companies. So if you take the global financial crisis, for example, that was caused by 50 men. Uh, and I've got 34 names so far, so I'm gradually hunting down who did it. Who did it to us, Matt? Uh, only one woman interested. I've only found one woman who I thought was culpable so far. Uh, but th those were men largely on the bond desks uh, in the financial sector in New York um, who basically saw an opportunity to line their own pockets. Um, and those 50 individuals created the global financial crisis which created an unbelievable amount of suffering across the planet 2008 and onwards, and we're still suffering some of the consequences today. Um, so those 50 guys doubled American debt in a year. They caused uh, 30 million people to be unemployed in a year globally. Uh, and goodness knows, hundreds of thousands of suicides as people's lives imploded. Um, and that was all down to 50 guys. And that's a sort of metaphor but when you've got poor quality decisions, when people are making decisions that are self-serving, not serving others, when they're being greedy and excessively self-interested, it causes suffering. So that's like a metaphor for why our business exists, is to metaphorically get to the 50, or, or in, as it turns out, the 500. There's 500 people really call, call the shots across the planet. So if we can get to the 500 and sort of effectively wake them up and grow them up, then we will reduce suffering on a massive scale. Okay, and uh, and what uh, what so what kind of changes have you had to make to your to your business and business model? Obviously, other than the fact that uh, you, you're not physically able to visit your customers right now. Well, like many other businesses, uh, you know, that are sort of effectively supplying uh, larger corporations. 
Um, a lot of the mar big, I mean, it's been very interesting to see some corporations are fighting through and accelerating into this digital transformation that's been sort of foisted upon them. Uh, and, but some companies have gone into panic mode and shut down and stop everything. Um, so we've seen a significant reduction in our revenue. So we've had to, first of all, the business is to survive, uh, cut our cost base back dramatically. So we furloughed some staff. Uh, we've all taken a significant uh, salary haircut um, and we sort of hunkered down, reduced the cost base to try and get to the other side of this. Um, as part of that, we've moved all of our consulting services online. Um, so my commute is not uh, now uh, an hour up to London. It's 27 seconds from my bedroom. So I can start earlier uh, and I do it all you know, digitally now, uh, in addition to running workshops. So we largely coach CEOs and, and C-suite, um, you know, individuals one-on-one. -on -one. So that can all be done over video conferencing, but also the leadership team uh, of organizations. So we'll coach the team as a team. And again, people can dial in to a video platform and you can do breakout groups and all sorts of things. So an awful lot of the things that we're teaching uh, our clients can be done in the, the virtual environment. So we've put our services all online effectively uh, and we've, we're also building out uh, a sort of online academy so people can do e-learning and e-development online. Uh, and we're accelerating a build out, which we had a planned uh, of an app ecosystem, uh, particularly pointed at the whole mental health issue. So we're, the sort of migration. So many businesses, as is no different, uh, who were thinking about, yeah, we need to start transforming ourselves and becoming more digital well, in this crisis, one of the things that happens in a crisis is you get 10 years in three months. Like it's an immense compression of time. And so COVID's probably done more for digital transformation of all businesses in the world than a thousand CEOs have ever done. Um, it's forcing everybody to go digital online and, and also how to get good at that. So what we've seen when we're coaching teams, for example, is you've got to restructure the way that you deliver the content because it's much more intense. When you've got 10 faces up close to the video, you can literally see every eyebrow move, you know, people are going up and down the eyebrow, so you can see it. Um, and it makes a quite a much more intense experience. So you've got to shrink the time that you're doing teaching. You can't do a one day workshop like, or a two day workshop that we may have done before you see. You've probably got to do at most a half a day or probably just 90 minute slugs. So much shorter, much briefer, much pithier, and also change the way you deliver it. So it, you have to adapt, you know, be a bit Darwin-esque about it. And one of the big things I've been talking about, you know, in, in a lot of my content and, and, and to, to anyone I've been advising is that I don't just see this now as a time that, we're, that we are, um, I guess, adapting, adapting and changing and therefore using this as a way to survive. I think, you know, a lot of the processes, procedures and changes we make now will actually be implemented Hmm. as part of the business model going forward and will will make us fundamentally better businesses you know, when we come out of the other end of this i mean yes there will be casualties along the way as there is in every in every evolutionary process but hmm. you know from a purely business perspective or from an individual's perspective it is be it is possible to come out of this better than we went in and i mean do you see some of the things that you've changed and implemented in your in your business staying with you going forward Oh, oh, definitely. I mean, if I could just commute for 27 seconds, there's a big benefit right there. Uh, and also, it's just lovely to be at home. We're very fortunate to have a, a nice uh, house to live in. Uh, and I get to see uh, my wife and kids, you know, and have dinner with them uh, on a more frequent basis. But in terms of the digital delivery, uh, I think a lot of businesses are realizing, do you know what, we, we don't need to fly around the world quite as much as we thought we did. Uh, one of our insurance companies uh, have realized they've got 90 offices in the UK. Uh, and because the home working is, they're thinking, wow, maybe maybe we don't need such a big footprint. Maybe we could get by with 50 offices. Yeah. Um, and so those sort of things will change permanently, I think. Um, but it, either in the structural things, in the way that we structure our business, but also I think there's going to be changes in how we relate to each other as human beings. I mean, you've seen, for example, uh, on a more social level, uh, people in you know cul-de-sacs and streets uh, around the nation uh, who never spoke to their neighbours you know the last 20, 20 years, but now they've got a WhatsApp group where they're all part and they're doing each other's shopping. 
Uh, I mean, we're seeing a fundamental, you know, resetting of of many things, uh, and the promise is that it won't decay uh, after the crisis is over. Um, I mean, I think the jury is still out as to how much will actually stick. Uh, I mean, I'm hopeful that many of the things that we've realised through this crisis, you know, it'll reset how people see, uh, you know, certain sectors of society, you know, van drivers uh, and auxiliary nurses and some people who we previously paid very low salaries to are getting a reset. And actually, society needs those people to function properly. And some of the highest paid individuals have been rendered largely irrelevant at this point in time. So it might reset the way that we see each other, certainly could reset the way that we relate to each other. I mean, I, uh, one of my four boys is up in London and we had Sunday lunch where, you know, we got him on video and we sort of basically ate with each other, chatting away through a sort of video kind of conferencing while we were having dinner together. Um, so it's going to change a lot of things. Uh, one of the big debates against not really happening in the media is how much of all of this will stick so if we, when all, when all said and done, you know, there may be quarter of a million, a million plus deaths globally, whatever it ends up being. So will those deaths be in vain? And they will be if we change nothing. Mm. So what's going to dictate whether any of this sticks or not, any of these changes, any of these insights we've learned about our own business and other businesses, what dictates whether they stick or not? Um, so I think that's an interesting question. Uh, or will we see, I mean, post the global financial crisis of 2008, everyone, oh, this is a game changer, it won't ever be the same again. And largely it went back to how it was. So not that much stuck after 2008. So one hopes that post COVID, there'll be some fundamental reassessments in who we are as human beings, how we relate to each other and what we're doing in the world. Well, we can certainly keep our fingers crossed and, and, all, and all do our little bit. Listen, Alan, it's been fantastic having you on. Uh, uh, and obviously, you know, the audience have loved asking you questions. And I'm sure when this, when this re-airs uh, later on and stays up on YouTube, you know, ad infinitum, uh, there's going to be loads of people who want to get in touch with you, even if it's just to send you a picture of their knee or an, an, mm -hmm. anything else anything else that they may need a medical opinion on so um just just, just give, give you give yourself a little shout out for your instagram twitter facebook you know, where, where can people find you? well just go and find us complete hyphen coherence.com is our website uh or just google dr alan watkins uh, and you'll find me and then uh, we're very very open and, and and receptive and responsive um so just reach out have a chat uh you know if you need some help uh, I've written a ton of books that you can find on Amazon. Um, so just reach out, have a chat, and you know if we can help you, we will. Fantastic, Alan. Thanks a lot again, mate. It's fantastic to uh, to see you. I'm sure I'm sure we'll be getting you on again in the future, and uh, and it's been really fantastic everything you've had to say. And I've loved how you've distilled it down to you know simplification for you know for both me and the audience. So thanks again, buddy. My pleasure, Matt. And look after Yorkshire for us. <laughs> I'll do my best. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Bye bye.